Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daphne Cook, and I want to thank you for joining us today for the Home Instead Aging Well series. We are at the Metropolitan Utilities District Culinary Theater, and today we are talking about all things holiday, what to eat, what to do, and we'll also spend some time talking about the post-holiday letdown that can sometimes happen after this special time of year. So to explore these topics, we've gathered some experts from home instead. We have Lakeland Hogan, and she is a gerontology and care expert. And from Metropolitan Community College, we have Chef Peter. Thank you both for joining us today. Chef Peter, we're gonna start with you. Okay. So what are you cooking today? Okay, we have and this is actually a derivative of literally what we had last night for dinner in the Walsh house. But this is a wow. sheet pan dinner uh, with Cornish hens and then some, some festive vegetables, some vegetables that are colorful, that look really pretty. It's a scalable recipe. Um, we're gonna talk about ways you can either follow this or not follow it and still make something delicious uh, for you and a small group or a little bit bigger group. So. I am so excited to see this sheet pan dinner because this time of year, so many things come up, but you still want to eat healthy, you still want to eat nutritious, and this seems like a way to do it. Yeah, we've got lots of whole foods on here, and this is, um, when we built this recipe, it's also super accessible. So uh, everything on this cart, on this list, minus the shallots, uh, you can get at Aldi. Um, they were out of stock on the Cornish hens this time, but we were trying to keep all of these items really uh, accessible. We're using a frozen vegetable, we're using some fresh sweet potatoes, but um, it's not a real fancy shop list, but it's a lot of whole foods and it ends up really delicious. I love hearing about that, how everything's accessible because this time of year, and I'm guilty of it too, I will be watching all the cooking shows and I'm like, oh, you know, exploring these seasonings or things that I never use any other time of year. And so it's so great not to fall into that trap, but still be able to prepare something that is delicious and something that's seasonal for the time of the year or that you can have any time of the year, really. Well, and you can, so this recipe we're doing with Cornish game hens, which are pretty easy to find in your grocery store. Uh, but you can also use chicken thighs. Ch I would say either chicken thighs or you could use a half, uh, half or a whole chicken that's spatchcocked like this. Um, but it, it's a flexible thing. And uh, if you don't have some of the ingredients, you could swap out something else. It, you're not stuck if you don't have the fancy things that are on the, uh, on the cooking show. So um, I'd love to get started uh, quickly. We're gonna do our first step uh, and we're gonna do slightly magic of television because these Cornish game hens have already been uh, spatchcocked is our word of the day, is this flattened out presentation. Uh, but we're gonna get these started in the oven um, and then we'll end up prepping some veg together and adding that to the pot, so. Well, we're gonna be checking in with you a little bit later. Absolutely. So. This step here, I'm just adding a little bit of olive oil to my pan. I want to make sure that we're not going to stick. One of the things that I did to cut down on the dishes, because nobody likes that giant holiday dish pile, um, is to line this sheet pan with foil so that it is less mess, because uh, we are going to do some browning on here. So I'm going to get a little, I got a little olive oil to make sure we're coated. You could use pan spray if you're really watching your fats, but the uh, fat that we get in the bottom here is going to be what helps to cook everything through the process. So I'm trying to thread the needle here and get a little pat of butter under each breast of these birds. I'm gonna put them skin side down to start to render the fat that's in uh, the skin. So whether this was a chicken thigh or a game hen, we want to start uh, with, our, with our skin down and it's just gonna help it get crispy towards the end. So these have already been, just to fill in where we left off, I'll show you how to do this uh, butchery procedure with the scissors, it's pretty easy. Um, but these have also been seasoned. We use some Lowry season salt. You could use if you've got like a poultry seasoning you like, but put that on a few hours before and the flavors will penetrate uh, into our pan here. So we've just got these on a grease sheet. We're gonna add some more things later, but we wanna get this process started. So we're gonna go into our oven. Got this one at 400 and this is a convection oven. Um, your cooking times can vary depending on what equipment you have in your home, but uh, anything will work. It just may take a little bit longer. Well, thank you so much. We're going to be checking back in with you in All a right, little sounds bit. Sounds great. Lakeland, thank you so much for being here today to talk with us about all things holiday. I just want to mention it's so great to have you partnering with us because when you think about 
this Aging Well series. Aging well doesn't happen at a particular time in your life. Mm -hmm. You're always looking to age well, regardless of how old you are. Yes, absolutely. Well, and thank you for having me back. It's good to be here again, and I'm excited for this delicious meal. Uh, but you're right, it does pair so well. You know, healthy cooking and eating well really um, goes a long way in our health and wellness across the lifespan. So research is starting to find that, you know, what we do in our 20s, 30s, and 40s, our lifestyle really impacts how we age. But even if you are kind of past that 65 threshold of um, an older adult category, if you will, you can still do a lot for your brain health and your physical health and wellness. And eating well is one of those things. And so, you know, getting a lot of fruits and vegetables and uh, incorporating some, we were talking about this earlier, plant-based items in your diet cutting down on some of that red meat, although I know it's hard for us in Nebraska to do that. Um, those types of things can really, again, go a long way in promoting healthy aging, or if you're younger, you know, can help you age gracefully uh, into your older years. Absolutely, as I was researching for this particular topic, I found it fascinating that a lot of the research coming out is showing that your lifestyle is a major indicator of quality of life. Mm -hmm. So really, there are just a few simple things that can be done to improve your life because 90% of what we're experiencing is lifestyle related. Yes, absolutely right. So, you know, eating, eating well is one component. Another is getting quality sleep. A lot of people don't get quality sleep. I'm probably guilty of that from time to time, but kind of developing a good sleep routine uh, to help kind of uh, wind down at the end of the night, making sure you're getting quality sleep, that goes a long way in your cognitive health. Also, exercise. Some scientists say that exercise is the best thing you can do for your brain, and it doesn't have to be like a CrossFit workout. It can be as easy as just walking, you know, multiple times a week. Uh, you know, 30 minutes could be your goal, uh, a couple times a week, and then you can kind of grow from there. And then simple weight training, and it doesn't have to be in a gym. It could be with soup cans or with resistance bands in your living room. And I think because of the pandemic, we've seen so much uh, physical activity, online workouts become so much more accessible to people in their homes. Uh, and of course, there's always the gym that you could go to. So simple things like that can really go a long way. And another is to keep learning and to keep growing. Uh, it doesn't have to stop once you uh, graduate high school or college or graduate school. Keep uh, continuing to learn, which I know Metro promotes continuing education, Absolutely. Uh, is another key component of that. Well, Lakeland, you mentioned some really um, easy things to do, and it's oftentimes uh, easy to kind of get overwhelmed by feeling, oh, eat healthy, so I have to be a vegan. Uh, go to bed, so now I need 10 hours of sleep. Yeah. But really, as you mentioned, it's those small changes that can go a long way. Yes. Yeah, and just, you know, maybe trying to go to bed 15 minutes earlier and uh, do that for a while and maybe increase it from there. Or just being as simple as turning the TV off 30 minutes before going to bed. That could increase your sleep quality. Or, you know, just incorporating one more vegetable into every meal. You don't have to, you know, throw out every single thing in the pantry and start from scratch. It can be those little gradual things that you can incorporate. And if 30 minutes of a workout seems like too much, start with 15, 10, 15 minutes. There's great like online yoga videos that you can do uh, in your home or just, again, walk around the block. We have been blessed with great weather here in Nebraska so far this fall, winter, uh, so I've been still able to get out and go for walks, and it's an easy way to just get some exercise and enjoy nature. Well, Lakeland, I so appreciate what you're saying because those small changes are things that I could see doing versus these sweeping changes <laughs> that seem so big. Well, and when we try to do sweeping changes, we kind of set ourselves up for failure. If you think about like how many New Year's resolutions have you um, put, put out there and then by January like 15th, you've already, um, you know, gone astray from those. It never works well. <laughs> right, exactly. And the 15th, you're being kind. Yeah, I know. More often than not, it's like, oh, it's been three days. I'm going to eat that sugar that I vowed I would never touch again. So it's everything in moderation, which I think is a great motto to live by. And again, it's just kind of starting small. And a lot of times having kind of an accountability partner can help you stick to those goals. So maybe it's a walking partner or um, you grocery shop with a friend and kind of challenge each other to try a new fruit or vegetable or a loved one 
Maybe you decide, let's make a healthy meal together. We used to do that in my household on Sundays. We'd have Sunday dinner and we'd try a new recipe. Uh, so that could be kind of a fun way to incorporate these lifestyle changes into your life. And again, it makes it less overwhelming. Yes. I was going to suggest to you that you're just adding one meal that's fish a week because there's Ooh, often that's a great not. Suggestion. There's in Nebraska we're so beef and pork centric that I think you know, and in experience with older generations too, there's typically not that much fish eating because frankly most of it was bad for a long time. But you can get way better fish in the area now than it used to when I was, you know, even when I was growing up. Um, the supply chain is way better, so. Yeah, and Chef, for me, I want to incorporate fish more, but I don't always know the best way to cook it. To so if you have any yeah, simple absolutely. tips on that, I think <laughs> I, I would appreciate it, and I'm sure others would too, because I feel like fish, I don't want to overcook it, and I don't want to undercook it. Yes. So I'm just, I'm like, I'll, I'll eat it when I go out to a restaurant and not prepare it at home. <laughs> but don't give it a shot at home. Um, I mean, it's as simple as grilling a lot of times, especially okay. when we're in summer seasons and you've mm -hmm. got garden vegetables, just a little bit of olive oil, a little salt, salt and pepper, and. Uh, get it onto the grill. You can do that with salmon. Okay. You could do it with white fish. Uh, that's probably the easiest low barrier. You can also roast a lot of things. Salmon roast really beautifully, mm, uh, yeah. sitting on the skin, and you could do a whole fillet. So, oh nice. And you can get uh, the salmon that's available locally. You can get good fresh salmon in the grocery stores. Uh -huh. um, that you're not going to go. Oh, this is questionable fish. So, um, and that one's loaded with uh, with good fats too. A lot of omega. Omega threes and sixes, I believe yeah. so. So healthy, healthy brain fats. Yes. Healthy brain fats, exactly. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, Lakeland, I want to talk about something that's on uh, the minds of a lot of people right now, and it's Omicron, COVID. <laughs> yes. How does this fit into travel, and how can we have a good, safe uh, holiday season? Yeah, I. I What's think happening right now with all that? I know there. Unfortunately, we're kind of working our way through the Greek alphabet when it comes to COVID. Um, and it is still very prevalent. I, I wished by now, when, you look, when we look back at the very beginning, I never thought we would still be kind of in the thick of it. But the reality is, is we are, and hospitals are feeling it, their, their beds are full. Um, and so when we get together for holiday gatherings this year, it's important to be mindful of that. So some tips that suggest, are suggested by the CDC include things like, you know, if you, if you are going to see a relative that might be immunocompromised, consider maybe getting a COVID test before you go over there, maybe the day before, uh, or maybe do a little mini quarantine leading up to visiting that loved one. Um, some other suggestions would be, you know, maybe keep it a little smaller. Maybe the whole entire family doesn't have to get together this year, um, but maybe it's more of the immediate family. And maybe you could zoom uh, into those other kind of smaller family mm -hmm. gatherings and kind of create that network virtually uh, of the larger family unit. Um, or, you know, we have been having great weather. We'll see if it continues. You could uh, consider hosting part of your event outside. Um, and. Um, you know, maybe around a fire pit or in your garage, or maybe just consider keeping the gathering a little shorter. That uh, reduces the kind of opportunities for exposure. And I know we love to hug and kiss around the holiday season, but you might also kind of go back to the elbow bump or like the, the foot bump, uh, foot high five, uh, instead of kind of those more uh, intimate um, displays of affection. And of course, mask wearing. I, I think that can really, really help um, and I know last year our family on Amazon found these holiday masks. So it was kind of fun. Everyone had a different holiday mask. You could have a decorating contest. Who could decorate the most festive mask? So you could that have a little like fun a with fun. it while, while still keeping it safe. Um, because again, it is still very prevalent. And especially for those that aren't vaccinated, um, you know, it might be a challenging conversation that you need to have with loved ones. Um, I know I've seen families have some divisiveness over this issue. And so having those conversations ahead of time, just to kind of level set, expectation set, can also help reduce any tension the day of the family gathering. So hopefully those tips are helpful. But again, it's so hard. Um, you know, we want to gather as families and friends. Uh, we want to spend time together, but we still might have to modify gatherings then again this year. And I'm hoping and praying that next year we're not having the same conversation. <laughs> well, and it's true. We want to gather, but we want to do it safely. Yep. You know, um, I had never heard of the foot thing. <laughs> the foot high five. Yeah, what? a little foot high five instead of a, a hand high five. Oh, a foot high five. Not as many germs. 
How do you get your leg that high up? Oh, Which well, I'm, I'm sitting in a chair. I and I want to show off my sparkle boots because okay, they're super cute. I was visualizing cute, a range of <laughs> motion that I No, yeah, it's not like a high thought. kick high I was high. thinking, wow, Maybe that low. requires some assistance. Like, okay. Just that. a little bit of balance. Oh, my. Okay, I feel better that. about that. Okay, so we can get a first peek. We've been in here for a little while. And this is, like I said, this is a convection oven, so we're moving a little faster than we would in a home context. Um, let me grab a tong and I'll show you what's happening underneath. So we are sitting on top of... Um, I feel like we're going to see some crispy skin. We're already going to start to see some color here. Oh, but we're oh, yeah. sticking a little bit. We're starting to build a little bit of color on our underside, um, which is great. But I'm going to add some shallots and I'm going to add some oh, herbs lovely. to this pan. So these are related to onions. They're basically a if you had to, I don't think they're actually this cross, but if a uh, cross between a red onion and garlic is probably the best way I can describe flavor-wise. If you were going to substitute something for them, um, I would substitute red onion. So. Okay. And Yum. when I, I, I get asked, what do shallots taste like? Um, and my answer is they taste like restaurant. Because it's, they're used, <laughs> they're used but, but it is, it's that different. Why can I never get it to taste like this at home? Well, this is one of the things that's incredibly common in commercial kitchens uh, that you don't find as frequently at the grocery store. So it's kind of that missing link a lot of times to, Well, you know, I'm already learning from you because you mentioned a couple things I don't do at home. I don't season my meat ahead of time to let the seasoning seep in. And um, I don't put the butter on to get that crispy skin. So I, I, I've got a whole new thing that I'm planning to do this weekend. You're al you already have ideas. So I'm also yes. going to put some herb sprigs in here. And they're just going to start to give up some of their flavor into the fat. And then we can pull them out. I'm not pulling them off the stems. So no chopping required. But we can get all this flavor from this rosemary just by having it sit in our fat. And then we're going to give this back to the oven for a little while longer. Uh, and we'll come back to add some sweet potatoes in a few minutes. And can, and continue the sizzling, like this, this, Let the this sizzling wonderful continue. sizzling. Let the sizzling continue, absolutely. This, this browning, that crispy skin. And we've already decided as a group that um, we are big fans of the crispy skin. Oh, so yeah. that's, that's already been pre-decided. <laughs> Lakeland, another thing that's on the minds of many is gift giving. Yes, are you done with your holiday shopping yet? Uh, about, you know, it's a little easier this year. My kids aren't little anymore. <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm about there. Yeah, I'm about three-fourths the way through. I have a few more gifts to get this weekend. But I know it is on everyone's minds. Uh, and we think about uh, those in our lives. I think family caregivers often kind of get overlooked or maybe they're, they feel a little underappreciated. So this time of year can be a great time to honor caregivers and give them a little something extra special. So um, at Home Instead, we've come up with kind of four tips uh, for gift giving for a family caregiver. So the first would be, um, you know, you could look for something that would give them time to themselves because often caregivers are giving so much of their time to others that they need a little respite, a little time away from the caregiving yes. situation. So you as a family member might say, you know, here's a certificate for three hours of my time to come over and be with uh, your loved one so that you can get some time away. You can look into services like Home Instead. We have professionals that could come and provide that respite. Um, or you could offer to just come be at the house while that individual takes a luxurious bubble bath and you could get them all the fixings for a bubble bath. So that's one suggestion. Also gift cards and subscriptions. Uh, maybe they'd rather get out and go to a spa. Uh, you get a little pedicure, massage, uh, maybe a subscription for um, kind of a meal service like the Hello Freshes that kind of helps simplify, mm -hmm. absolutely helps simplify. Or maybe they like wine, a wine subscription, something of that sort. So think about some some gift cards that would be helpful um, and fun for them. And then acts of service, things like um, this year I'll shovel all your snow anytime it snows. Oh, that would or, be a big one for yeah, me. Yeah, come and do lawn work this spring. Uh, those acts of service, giving back to that caregiver, say, taking something off their plate uh, could be helpful. And it could be also as simple as, hey, I'm going to grocery shop for you uh, the, for the next month as you kind of get through the holidays, give me your list, I'll go for you. I was going to say even like an Instacart premium oh, subscription yeah. to where you, yes. get, you, know, you get a lot of your delivery fee off for the duration of a year. Absolutely, that is a cool a, that's one. a good one. Or really some, good idea. Or uh, somebody paid to mow the lawn during the peak season uh -huh. or something. 
yeah. something that's already booked that uh, my problem yeah. is is when I sign up for gifts like that then I actually have to do them so <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so if you can outsource it uh, it's guaranteed <laughs> to be successful well, or higher higher chance of at least in my book but absolutely so those are some great suggestions yeah. and one final one is is recognition um, a lot of times a handwritten note of thanks goes so far. Maybe you couple that with some fresh flowers or maybe a fresh wreath for them to put on their door this year. Um, again, caregivers often, it's a thankless job for a lot of people and um, so that recognition goes a, a long way. Um, and I know we can talk about you know older adult gift ideas too in just a bit, um, but those are some ideas for, for family caregivers. I know this isn't my segment, but I have to jump on this. <laughs> which is when you're saying um, that recognition in that card that you're giving that as a when I manage in kitchens one of the cardinal rules of if you want to motivate people and let them know you're grateful is to praise publicly mm -hmm. so we always say discipline yes. discipline in, pri in private and praise in front of everyone so if you do have that small family gathering and you're able to call out uh, the person who's done so much for you and say hey they've you know, they've given all this time, they've done this, I just want to say thank you. Like, that's a big full bucket for that person yeah. who has given so much of themselves to. That's a great suggestion. And I love these suggestions because you have things that maybe cost money, but then there's so many things that you can do, like it's recognition, yeah. that, that don't cost money and that people would appreciate. Yes. Um, I just want to mention that, so the chicken is cooking and it is wafting it through is the so, air. It smells so good. Chef, you mentioned that you know the rosemary would give up its oil or essence. So this needs to be a candle. Chicken and rosemary, mm. that just yes. needs to be a candle. I would buy it, it smells amazing. <laughs> I've been joking about a line of candles called mandals for, that of course I've never done this, but um, that would smell like veal stock or chicken Ooh. and rosemary or savory things. I think that you have probably just inspired an entrepreneur and now they're going to take your idea. I hope that they can because I don't have time to do that one, but I have a strong suspicion that won't be how I get rich if I ever do so. It's, it's a great idea though. So we're talking about gift giving, but what about for um, aging population? Because there, there are different things like maybe cognitive uh, abilities. or mm -hmm. so, so what would be good for, um, for aging population? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that you can consider. You know, often, I even think of like my parents and grandparents, they have everything. So one thing to consider is an experience or something to look forward to. And we'll talk a little bit later about how after the holidays, sometimes it's a little bit of a letdown. So maybe your gift is an experience that will take place in the spring or in January or February. Maybe it's um, coming over and you cook this beautiful meal for them. Um, yes. Maybe it's finding a play or like a symphony performance to give them tickets to. Um, maybe it's a little trip. Uh, it could be somewhere that you actually go to or it could be a virtual trip. Again, through the pandemic, so many places have created virtual experiences like going to a, a museum in France. You can do a virtual tour now. Um, so you could kind of create uh, an experience that way. And for someone maybe with mobility issues or cognitive issues, that virtual experience could be really meaningful uh, to them. So again, it's something that might not cost a whole lot of money, but that time spent with loved ones, that experience often means so much more than any kind of tangible gift that, that you can give. So that's one, one example. Uh, another would be kind of more nostalgic, sentimental gifts. Um, I know that recently my grandparents celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary, which is incredible. And for that day, we created a video montage of all of the kids and grandkids saying a little video message to our grandparents saying congrats. We shared a memory that we uh, held dear, near and dear to our hearts, um, and they loved it. It was so meaningful to them, uh, and they can watch it over and over again. So if you're not tech savvy, you could always create a scrapbook or a lot of online um, websites like Shutterfly, um, Snapfish, you can create a book online that's printed, maybe of photos. You could do old photos, especially for those with cognitive impairment. Um, looking at old photos, often they, they retain those memories and they can bring back some really sweet memories. So um, something kind of nostalgic and sentimental uh, could be another great gift. And then of course those practical gifts like blankets, socks, 
Um, if they have uh, like a favorite, I know one of my family members loves salted cashews. And so each year she gets like a giant container of salted cashews. And she gets more excited about that than anything else that anyone gives her. Um, and then maybe it's creating a new holiday tradition. Again, things might have to look a little different. Maybe it's a new tradition of everyone de decorating masks and having a competition. Uh, maybe it's doing uh, one of those car parades where you drive by with signs and you honk your horn. Uh, or maybe it's, um, you know, everyone picking a recipe and cooking it and then hopping on Zoom and uh, sharing, you know, how did it turn out? What were some tips that you could share? Um, so those are just a couple simple things that you could consider when, when um, gift giving. It doesn't always have to be um, something extravagant. I think we can get carried away sometimes with gifts. I'm guilty of that. Uh -huh. uh, or you rack your brain trying to find the most perfect thing, but often uh, that experience or just time spent together uh, means more and it creates memories which last forever. Well, and practical gifts are good gifts because yes. you can absolutely use them. Oh, abs yes, absolutely. And who doesn't love like a fuzzy pair of socks or a cuddly blanket this time of year um, or even just you know helping them stock up on some of their essentials uh, maybe they have a special perfume that they love or uh, maybe they would like get very excited about just a bunch of toothpaste and, and new toothbrushes so mm -hmm. it can be something as uh, elaborate as um, you know perfume or it can be something as simple as tooth toothpaste so uh, it might also help to just kind of ask them hey I would like to get you something this year you know what what are some things that you're needing or what's on your list um, for your next grocery run can I pick that up for you well you know it sounds kind of silly but one of the things I get my kids for Christmas every year is I get them a big bag and it has toothpaste and socks and deodorant. And they love that bag. They, <laughs> they're well stocked into the summer. Yeah. So that's one of the things that they, they look forward to. Oh, absolutely. Um, and actually at Home Instead, we have been doing this Be a Santa to a Senior program where we collect uh, names and wish lists for older adults in our community where they don't necessarily get a gift at Christmas time. Um, and a lot of times those items on there are those simple things. Um, personal care items, socks, pajamas. Uh, and that program is still going. If you want to participate, you can go to BeASantaToASenior.com and you can buy a, a senior or something off their wish list. And we partnered with Am Amazon Business. So you can just order it on Amazon and it gets shipped right to their front door. So. Um, if you don't have an older adult loved one in your life to kind of give back to this year, you could always consider our Be a Santa to a Senior program. What a great way to give back. Absolutely. Okay, now, Chef, I see you have some sweet potatoes on there now. Yeah, so we have some sweet potatoes. I wanted to get uh, the, the chicken started here. We, we could have probably added these a little earlier on too, but we wanted to keep lots of color. So we're adding these now. Um, some salt and some pepper. We'll add, a, if there's not enough fat in your pan to just give them a little coat, uh, you may want to add a little bit more, uh, and I am just because this side's a little dry here. Now, there's lots of beautiful things that happen in a recipe like this, and it's I don't know, worse. Yeah, you can see in the bottom of my pan, we're building up all this brown flavor, and the chicken thighs or the game hens as they roast, they start to give up not just fat uh, from the skin and any um, extra fat deposits, but they're also giving up uh, moisture and collagen and all these wonderful things that start to brown and caramelize on your vegetables. So this is sort of like a sauteed recipe uh, that we're stretching out over a longer period of time. You're allowing the, uh, the pan and the action in the oven uh, to brown the things that are in here. So we're developing flavor and browning. Uh, if you do this with chicken thighs, you basically got potatoes that are cooked in schmaltz, which is uh, absolutely out of this world. Deliciousness? So, delicious, yeah. I feel like I'm learning so much from you, so I want to mention I've taken a couple of classes um, on the culinary side, and what's been really amazing is those recipes, when I've remade them, I've been told they taste restaurant quality. But it's really just those little tips, like the tips that you provided today, that have made such a big difference. Yeah, it's little things, and it's, and it's paying attention to details as you cook um, that's really the big difference in building flavor. So if you're making a soup, uh, you're layering flavors. You're starting to sweat some aromatics, you're adding some herbs, and you're building things up as you go. And the more, um, I guess, care and attention that we give to the little things, those all add up to some really big things that add up to big delicious, which 
sounds like you've discovered and taken some I, courses. I so. did. I'm <laughs> very happy. So Lakeland, um, a lot of people refer to this as the most wonderful time of the year. There's commercials about people getting cars with big bows and the <laughs> fluffy snow. But really, for some, there's this post-holiday letdown after the hustle and bustle dies down. So what can we do to um, continue the feeling or, or kind of alleviate that, that post-holiday letdown? Yes, that's such a good point because you think about it, <clears throat> many people have Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, back to back. A lot of family is around. There are a lot of activities, so much festivity. And then we don't really have another holiday to celebrate until, you know, Valentine's Day or Easter, which seems forever away, especially in cold, snowy Nebraska. Um, and so there is that period where sometimes people, uh, they experience isolation, loneliness, a little bit of depression after the holidays. The holiday blues is kind of what we oh, cash. It's real. It yeah. is real, absolutely. But it's not something that we should ignore if we're seeing signs of this in our loved ones. But I would say there's a few things we can do to kind of help reduce that. And one of those is that, that gift I talked about earlier, something to look forward to. So whether it's um, creating some regular get-togethers, maybe it's a meal, a Sunday dinner. So every week, uh, maybe it's every other week, maybe it's a monthly breakfast that the family I gets together I love the idea for. of a meal because you're giving your time, yeah. oh, that's awesome. you're breaking bread, and so many wonderful yes. things happen when you break bread together. Absolutely, and so so often older adults live alone. Uh, they're less likely to cook for themselves if it's just cooking for one. I know for myself, if it's just me at home at night, I'm eating like a can of tuna and some carrots and hummus. Like I'm not making something fancy, but if my fiance's there, I'll make something you know more appealing. Um, so often older adults, they, they'll eat more if they eat with others. And so they'll eat more nutritious meals, they'll take in uh, more of those nutrients. So that could be something that you kind of establish in the months of January, February, March, just to kind of get everyone through those holiday slumps. And then uh, you could also um, start a new hobby or an activity. Maybe you join a book club. And there's a lot of virtual things also if you can't get together in person. Uh, maybe you take up um, knitting or uh, card playing, something of that sort. Learn, learn something new, kind of set a goal for yourself. Um, again, that's something to work towards, something to get you hopefully interacting with others. That was an experience that I had had that I'd yeah. want to share is that finding something that gets you engaged through that season is when I used to notice that after, and you know, this is in my late 20s and early 30s, obviously not the same, exact same situation, but feeling this like absolute letdown after the Super Bowl. Because I was playing mm -hmm. fantasy football and I'd go to the bar and you know, meet up with folks and have drinks and whatnot, but then once we got on the other side of football, before the NCAA tourney started, it was just like this, oh, it was just like mm -hmm. dead void in, um, in your life to where, you know, and you would, it would get me down. So I actually, the fix that I found was ice fishing, which is a oh. very physical hobby in some ways that can be hard for everybody to do. But that sense of getting a hobby, especially if it's something that gets you outside, whether it's cold or not, for any amount of time that you can tolerate it and dress appropriately, fresh air still counts mm -hmm. in the winter and it makes a huge difference. Even just bundling up to go around for a walk around the block, uh, you get good exercise just getting all your clothes on sometimes. So, <laughs> um, but the fresh air and the having a hobby that engages you, like that's something for yeah. me that I won't let go of because it changed the way I view the winter. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. You know, Chef, uh, you mentioned ice fishing. And for some reason, I've been told by a couple of different people they think that I would like it. But now that you say it's physical and hard, I, I don't think so. Well, it depends on, <laughs> it, well, if somebody else, depends on which way you do it. I do it the physical way, which is drag everything in the sled myself and oh, no, set I'm it all up. <laughs> but you can also find, and actually this could be an opportunity um, that might fit into that trip that you were talking about scheduling, yeah. uh, to where you can find outfitters in South Dakota and Minnesota who will go put a house out on the ice for you that has heat and a bed and you can overnight out there now we're talking and, and fish and cook and <laughs> yeah that sounds something and they drive that you out there about. on a snowmobile yeah that's yeah, that's, that's probably that's more, more my speed yeah really no the <laughs> physical dragging everything on a sled oh that's, no but, no <laughs> but that's how i get my exercise in the winter it's great i you know you don't have to be in for that but no i just I mean, want to put my time are, in in the gym and then just you know and then pay for somebody <laughs> to take you out there on a sled. yes yeah yes. that's a good plan 
<laughs> I like that plan. Well, and yeah, so discovering a new hobby could be one way to kind of avoid those blues. And then one final one is, is volunteering. You know, so many people volunteer this time of year during the holidays. But often nonprofits, they see a drop off in volunteers after the first of the year, and that's when they really need a lot of help. So whether it's um, you know volunteering, you know in person, or you know calling up a local shelter, seeing what their wish list is, maybe they need blankets made, or maybe you could do a little uh, food drive amongst your friend group. Just uh, an opportunity to give back um, does a lot of things for you. It keeps you, it gives you an, something to do, something to look forward to, but it also gives you that feeling of, of meaning and purpose. Uh, and so often older adults, you know, if they've retired and they've checked off a lot of their bucket list, they might find themselves feeling like, okay, what, what now gives me meaning and purpose? Maybe for some it's their family, um, but maybe for some it could be volunteering. So those are a couple tips. Um, but regardless, I would encourage people to check in on their aging loved ones, especially after the holidays. Uh, don't, don't stop checking in uh, at this holiday time. You know, let it carry over into the new year. Maybe that's one of your resolutions as a family member is to schedule a weekly call or check in. Um, or maybe it's just vowing to send a few more pictures to them via maybe it's Facebook or there's a bunch of family apps that you don't have to you know broadcast all your photos on Facebook we use GrandPad in our family and everyone in our family can upload photos and it gets people talking it pe makes people in our family feel really connected so there's a lot of things that you can do but just don't forget your older loved ones after the holidays Lakeland if we're checking in on our loved ones are there some signs that we could look for that might indicate those that holiday slump that you mentioned yeah, <clears throat> there certainly are. One would be um, kind of ask them how they've been sleeping. You know, if you find that they're sleeping a lot more during the daytime or they're not sleeping well at night, um, that could be a sign that maybe there's some, some loneliness, some depression. You know, if you don't have much going on during the day, you might be more likely to sleep uh, during the day, which might cause you to sleep poorly at night. Um, so that could be an indicator. Also, if you, if you pop over to their house, and you kind of notice that you know, they usually kept their house pretty tidy, but now it's, a, it's quite a bit messier, the bills are piling up. Now it might be a sign that they're, they're feeling a little depressed, they don't feel the need to keep things tidy. Um, another sign would be kind of their own personal hygiene. If they always kind of got up and got themselves ready for the day, and now uh, they're looking a little um, disheveled uh, or they just aren't putting that effort in, it might be because they're feeling a little lonely, isolated, they don't feel like they have anything to get up and get ready for. So those are the kinds of things that you can look for. And then, you know, kind of just talk to them about it. You know, tell me how you've been feeling. What have you been up to? Um, you know, and if they are feeling lonely, you can, you can offer up maybe some of those suggestions that, that I um, listed off earlier. Okay, Chef, now tell us what's happening over here because mm -hmm. first off, I have to comment on the fact that you have made a piece of art. Over here. It's really it's, there's so much color going on here. That's one of the things that I love about this is that we are literally using one pan and a cutting board to pull this off, um, and it's going to look just brilliant and stunning by the time you get done. So we're almost there. Our potatoes are. Start, I just kind of rolled these over a little bit. Our birds are close. I can tell by the way we can get a thermometer and temp these too. But just the way that. Uh, well, the meat's contracting. I know we're really close. I wanted to get my last vegetable on here, which is green beans. And these are literally just frozen whole green beans. And they've done half the work for you. So these are already blanched and shocked. So the color's locked in. And you can absolutely put these on a, roast, on a tray of roasted vegetables. And they're brilliant green. We're going to get them coated with some of this delicious caramelized shallot juju that we've created in the bottom of the pan here. We'll go a little salt and pepper, and we're going to go back in the oven for kind of final stages here. Um, the birds will finish browning, we'll finish cooking our sweet potatoes through, uh, and then we'll plate this up at the end. So we've got, I uh, actually got some, I'll show you what else we've got towards the end, but I have Ooh. some dried cherries. Nice. I have some dried cherries and some walnuts that we're going to add to sort of the sweet potato side of our pan, uh, and we'll let those beans just kind of take up all the, the fat and the shallots that we're um, that were on here earlier so and what's really exciting is everything that you've mentioned so far today are things that i have at home and even just like the foil i am a big fan of not having dishes and the lowry's i have not met anyone who does not have lowry's in their house <laughs> well that's why i didn't pick some exotic 
blend. I mean, you know, you're going to have Lowry's, and that's got uh, more than you would start with, right? So you get some garlic, you get some paprika, you get some good basic spices in there that are that go great with roast chicken. So why not? Um, we don't have to make it harder than it has to be, and you can pull this off. And like I said, so when we get a minute, I'm going to show you guys how to cut one of those birds the way that we did this one. Oh yeah, that'd but be great. you can do one bird and it'll feed two people like kings um, on a little pan in your house with dirtying one pan. So uh, really flexible technique that you can do with lots of stuff. Or it can create leftovers too. Yeah, yeah it versus. just depends on how, <laughs> I love on, good leftover. on the lens that you view the world through. I yeah. know there's leftover people and there's anti-leftover people. So <laughs> I'm a leftover person. Oh, and I also just want to mention that we do have someone monitoring our chat. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to drop them in at any time because we do have someone monitoring. Lakeland, fresh on the heels of Christmas is New Year's. Yes. And it seems like with every new year, there's New Year's resolutions, but oftentimes they're not sustainable. So do you have any suggestions on making some New Year's resolutions that maybe would be sustainable? Yes, as we talked about earlier, so often my New Year's resolution would be, oh, I'm going to lose 20 pounds this year, which by, you know, January 15th, I've already, um, you know, strayed from that goal or I've lost my motivation uh, for that goal. So, you know, making kind of more practical goals uh, is helpful. Um, and so really you can think about the areas that you want to kind of make some strides and improvements um, and then start small. Maybe make little milestones for yourself throughout the year. And it could go back to those areas of health and wellness that we started out talking about. Uh, maybe it's getting into a better sleep routine at night. I know a few years back I vowed, you know, I'm not going to turn the TV on 30 minutes before I go to bed. Um, sometimes if I'm really having a hard time winding down, I make a cup of herbal tea. And that's kind of like a, a signal to my brain that, okay, we're winding down. And it's also cozy. And uh, instead of you know watching TV, maybe I'll open a book or do a little journaling at night, uh, just again to kind of wind my brain down. So maybe that's something that you choose to do. Um, or maybe um, you uh, want to wake up a little earlier to get some exercise in. So maybe it's waking up you know 20 minutes earlier in the morning uh, finding a time throughout the day. Maybe maybe you're not a morning workout person. That's when I prefer it because if I don't do it in the morning, I'm not going to do it the rest of the day. Uh, or maybe it's an afternoon walk. And choosing that time, um, set that time, si time aside um, and, and make it a priority. Um, or again, engage that workout buddy. Uh, so those little things, um, those little kind of changes that you can implement in your in your day to day can go a long way. Um, and they say it takes 30 days to develop a habit. I'm pretty sure that is is the fact. So you can make you could start off by making it a 30 day goal, and then hopefully by 30 days it's kind of become part of your routine. It's become a habit, um, and then uh, you can kind of take it from there. And maybe reassessing your goal every so often could be helpful. That way you can, you know, kind of track your progress towards that goal, um, or maybe you can need to recalibrate uh, your goal to make it more achievable once you kind of veer off course. You know, okay, I'm not following my plan. <laughs> What's going wrong and how can I kind of get back on track or make it easier for me to do so? Lakeland, as a health expert, what are your thoughts on having this goal look like what it does for you versus somebody else? So for example, you mentioned sleep. Um, I am an early bird, which <laughs> means I go to bed early. And I had to be okay with the fact that uh, it's uh, 9.30 p.m., but I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs> and 9.30 doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. But how, how do you kind of reconcile that, making these goals work for you and not for other people or whatever the suggested? Yeah, well, I think everyone is so different. Everyone's circumstance is different. At, even at different stages of your life, your life looks different. Um, you know, when you're in a season of, of being a college student, you're probably gonna be up late and uh, you might kind of have an, a weird sleep schedule. You know, when you're a parent, a young parent, 
Obviously, your sleep schedule probably revolves around uh, others, and little people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then maybe as you become an empty nester, you kind of get to kind of choose when you go to bed and, and uh, make a routine for yourself. But it's important not to compare yourself to others. I think that's a good lesson and a good kind of mantra to live by because everyone's situation is different. Um, I also love to go to bed at 9.30. I like to wake <laughs> up at 5.45 and some people say, oh my gosh, how can you wake up that early? I don't know. It's just how my body works and over time that's how I've adjusted um, and I kind of prioritize things in my day. It might look very different for somebody else and, and that's okay. So you have to kind of find what works for you. Of course it's, it's fun to kind of try what other people are doing because you might find getting out of your routine and your comfort zone uh, opens up some new possibilities or you might find that you really like doing things a different way. But uh, take it easy on yourself, you know, find what works for you. Um, try not to compare yourself too much to others. That would be my advice. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, That's Chef, awesome. I see you have this chicken out. I have this chicken and I want to show you guys how to look cool. Um, without, we're, we're not even really going to use a knife. Um, wow. So we have one of these game hens. Uh, and I've got just a poultry shear, your, your kitchen, kitchen shears. And we're gonna do a few modifications that allow this to cook faster and flat rather than roasting whole. And you could absolutely do what we're doing with the bird in this state, um, but in terms of getting things done on a Tuesday night, uh, this spatchcock look is, is really pretty and easy to do and things cook a little more evenly. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna lop off my wing tips because they kind of get in the way um, when we're down on our breast. So I just took off the last portion of the wing here. And now we're going to flip this guy over. And what we're, well, the idea with this technique, and it can be done with a knife, um, but for a smaller bird like this, the scissors work well. But this, we're going to remove the backbone and allow the bird to unfold. So I want the tail end, the tail is marked by this little tail stub, and we're basically just going to cut on either side of the tail. And you're cutting through the rib bone, so it might sound a little crunchy, don't... Um, I do don't hear let it. That, you do <laughs> hear it, yeah. Don't let that bother you. But it's way easier to do this, and it's a lot easier to do this with a shear on a small bird like this than it is a chicken. Um, oh, we're almost there. Hold on. Oh, there we go. I think we got, a, we got a little frozen, a little ice. I don't think anybody wants a chicken slushy though, so we're going to get rid of that. <laughs> um, but see what we've got here? This now goes totally flat. If you want it even flatter, uh, we can score this keel bone. And this is the, it's a piece of cartilage uh, that sort of holds the breast together. But we can score that a little bit and just pop it. And now it lays perfectly flat. So these grill beautifully. Uh, they work great roasting like this, but it's just a different presentation, helps things cook a little quicker, and it makes you know, makes you look like you know what you're doing when you spatchcock a bird. It's like, oh, how'd you do that? That's fancy. It's very impressive. It is fancy. Yeah. Uh, something it, else I'll be trying this weekend. But it doesn't take a lot. I mean, you guys saw that this is just a couple minutes, and, and that's ready to go. And, uh, we'll season this with uh, some Lowry's and I, I put this next to my small sheet pan. Maybe Nate can zoom out a little bit. So this is a quarter sheet, so this is half the size. Uh, and this would make absolutely lovely dinner for two. Um, wow. And one bird. So, so very scalable. This is sort of your family of four model over here. Here's the uh, date night. So Date night. Lakeland. Date night. Go. All right, this That's is also on my weekend to do. <laughs> so you were talking about resolutions and I did want to talk about um, some, I think the most comfortable I've been with how I did with a resolution uh, and often mine are in regards to food and you know, I want to lose 20 pounds like everybody else, but I didn't make the resolution the goal. Mm. I made it the thing I was going to do to get to the goal with no indication of what I was of how I was failing. So my resolution was I'm going to eat less processed foods this year. Mm. I'm going to try to not eat any, you know, oh, yeah. that doesn't come from a whole state. Uh, and that one kicked in wonderfully and I probably kept that one two thirds of the year before I got into a stress. You know, I got into a stress phase and we all backslide on yeah. things and oh, it's yeah. always ebbing and flowing, but uh, picking that little thing you want to do not to say I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to lower my cholesterol, but I'm going to eat Cheerios for breakfast and salmon once a week, or yeah, I'm like going to eat vegetables. 
I like that. It's a better place to start. Well, and, and I've heard too, you know, when you're trying to eat a little, eat healthier, you know, an 80-20 rule. You know, 80% of the time, try to do those whole foods, try to cook uh, for yourself. But, you know, 20% of the time, we have to live our lives. Right. You know, we are going to maybe go out to dinner or I love ice cream. I want a bowl of ice cream, you know. And so I think that kind of 80-20 rule for some people is a good mantra to live by. Now, some people, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. So maybe they, they got to be an all or nothing. But again, that goes back to it has to work for you. Um, and I like uh, what Chef recommended, you know, maybe it's just eating salmon once a week or a piece of fish introducing that into your diet. Uh, it could be you know, something as simple as that. Well, I love the suggestion because it's more of a holistic approach yes. and it looks at a step that you can take to get the desired outcome mm -hmm. versus looking at this outcome that can just feel so big as we yeah. discussed previously. Well, we have a couple of questions Ooh, great. that were in the chat. Uh, this first one is for you, Chef. Okay. Can we freeze food what is the general rule regarding freezing leftovers? Regarding freezing leftovers, um, certain things freeze well and others don't. Um, soups typically freeze pretty well. Uh, did I guess we don't have anybody on the line, so I can't talk to the voice on the telephone. <laughs> um, wanted to know what they wanted to freeze. Uh, like leftover stuffing, leftover, certain things will freeze great. Leftover stuffing, casseroles. Some of that does well. The thing to avoid is anything that has a grain or a noodle inside of it. Um, because if you freeze beef and barley soup, and then you rethaw it, every bit of barley will become the size of an olive. <laughs> and you will not have any liquid, yeah. Um, you'll, you'll run out of liquid. So being cognizant of stuff like that where you've got things that are gonna break down. Um, sometimes when you refreeze, you can damage proteins too because the cell walls burst as things freeze because the water expands and it will break cell walls. So the more times you freeze something, uh, the tougher on it is. But there are some things that freeze really well. Chili, chili freeze is awesome. Stocks, um, your chicken noodle soup without the noodles, all those work out pretty awesome. Okay, we have another question. What is a favorite holiday memory or tradition involving Food. Involving Ooh. food. So you both have to answer this. Okay. okay. I'm going to let you go first because oh, wow. I don't know what I want to say yet. Do you know one? Do you have one? I do. So um, for years, I um, have a, a friend. We met when we were 15. And we have just this special friendship. I met her through the Ollie Webb Mentoring Program here in Omaha. Um, and she and I have a cookie baking tradition. So every year for the last 15, I think we're going on 17 years. I'm going to admit my age there. We have had a day where we bake cookies together. And actually, we're going to do it this Saturday. Um, and we, in the last couple of years, we've gotten matching pajamas. So we wear those every year. <laughs> and we bake cookies and we watch a Christmas movie. Um, and we share a meal together. And it's just fun. Um, and we make these candy cane cookies. They're like this yummy, buttery almond cookie where you do half the batch. You leave half the batch white and you color half the batch red. Then you roll them and you form them into candy canes and they're absolutely delicious. So that's probably one of my fondest memories. And, and last year I lined up pictures of us, because we take a picture every year, you know, of all the years we've done a cookie baking day. Uh, and it's just fun to look back and you know, see how you've changed and what cookies we've you know, introduced into our repertoire. Um, I think baking is a fun way to come together and um, just enjoy time and also the result is pretty delicious. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yes. Well, did you think it won, Chef? Uh, yeah, so, and I was actually alluding to it without knowing I was doing such a thing. <laughs> um, when I talked about how well that stuffing freezes, uh, which is, and this is one that I adopted. So my wife, um, her grandma made this very traditional uh, country stuffing that was very wet. It's almost pudding-like, but it's super meaty, and I never really understood exactly what was going on with it. The couple times I had it while her grandmother was alive, um, and a few years after um, Helen had passed away in Columbus, I was said, can you recreate this? And I'd had the dish a couple times, and I called around to some of the ants and to discover her method. And basically, you cook an entire chicken, you grind it up in, the, in a meat grinder, and then that gets folded in with all the bread. And wow. it, it's really simple recipe, it's just more about technique. Uh, but that's become something that now, I've sort of taken that torch, and um, when we get together with that side of the family, that's an absolute requirement that I bring 
um, Helen's dressing. So uh, that's, that's an adopted one. My mom and I also used to do an annual cookie bake. We've been bad about it the last couple of years as the kids have gotten older. It's been yeah. harder to keep up on it, but um, I'm hoping that's coming back uh, at some point here. I'm cutting up a little bread because who doesn't like bread? Uh, uh, yes, bread. With their dinner. <laughs> Delicious. Well, I would have to say if I'm thinking about a special food, I don't think about a particular food. I think about just kind of like what we and my family eat over the holidays. So every year I think, you know, maybe I should just order Thanksgiving dinner from somewhere or maybe <laughs> I should order Christmas dinner. And I never can because uh, my kids want foods to taste the way they expect. And so we eat a cornbread dressing that I learned to make from my mother and my grandmother um, who are from the South. We eat something called mock caviar, which is kind of like a, a cream cheese ball with anchovies, which you're like, oh, no. I, I love salty, savory, that could be, Yeah, I'm in on and that. So, that sounds tasty. you know, with parsley and garlic and lemon. So we make in, uh, this mock caviar and a shrimp ball. And so there's certain things, and they look forward to having those things that time of year. Nobody is making mock caviar. Okay, <laughs> you can't, you're not going to pick you that up at the grocery at store <laughs> yeah. or at the restaurant. <laughs> And so they want these certain things, um, and those are the things that they're looking forward to. And so I have not been able to order my uh, holiday dinner from anywhere because they want the special holiday food. Yeah, I, it, we were talking about this earlier, but food and the smells of the holidays just bring back so many fond memories, and people hold tight to those. And so when you break away from traditions, sometimes it's hard, uh, but sometimes you can find fun new traditions. But I. I also love, you know, the traditional holiday foods, and you do look forward to it because it's not something you necessarily make every year. You know, my uncle makes this sweet potato casserole that has like probably just as much uh, brown sugar pecan topping as there is sweet potato underneath. <laughs> oh, it is dessert. It's hey, he sounds so like a man good. after my own heart. <laughs> yeah, and I don't. I would never make it because I don't want to know what's in it. I'm sure it's like a whole block of cream cheese, maybe two or three sticks of butter. I don't care. I'm eating it on Christmas or Thanksgiving, but it is so yummy, and I look forward to that every year. <laughs> oh, that sounds delicious. It's kind of like a, I I love pecan pie. And then I went to make it one year, and I was like, how much sugar is this? <laughs> like, this is, this is just sugar <laughs> I wish yet. I didn't know. I know. <laughs> yeah. If you could only look, turn back the other way now, right? Yeah. yeah, I don't think I've eaten it as much. So you are plating this up, and I just have to say, um, I'm one who likes to eat with my eyes first, and I just think it's so beautiful, the colors. Just, it yes. makes It's very inviting. And I'm a texture person, so I love um, having, I added nuts to anything. And so nuts and vegetables, nuts in my salad. So it, it just looks very inviting. It does. And I, did you add nuts there, Chef? To I the did. Crispy? I added some walnuts. So they were toasted ahead of time, but I love getting a little extra brown. So I just put a few on the beans, and then we'll put some cherries. You could put cherries on both sides if you wanted to, but I was going to do some red with our sweet potatoes. Mm. I'm going to add some of these right now. And everything is just so healthy. So you have the green beans with the walnuts, and again, healthy fat, um, the um, sweet potatoes um, with the with the protein with the Cornish hen, yes. and then you have more fat from the olive oil and from the Cornish hen. Yeah, you so. get the, it, this is a leaner way of doing this, so it's probably healthier to do this with a game hen than a chicken thigh, because mm -hmm. chicken thighs just give up all kinds of fat, which is, is glorious <laughs> in one way, because if you put baby potatoes in a bunch of chicken fat, you won't be sad. But no, uh, this not. is a little, uh, there's not that much extra fat coming off of our Cornish game hens. So we've got a little bit of butter, but we've got olive oil, we've got um, nuts, you've got poultry, which is a you know reasonably lean meat on the standard of, of things we could have. So now I just cut these in half so that they're um, into individual portions, and then we'll just sort of make a little stack. And when you can make something like this the way you have prepared it um, in one sheet, the types of ingredients that you use, it makes it really easy to want to eat healthy. Like why would you stop off at a fast food place eating who knows what? and when you could have this. Well, and you don't make this because you're trying to be healthy. You make this because it's the best thing you've eaten in three weeks. Right. Like okay. it's, um, 
but you are using a lot of whole foods and there's, you know, uh, sweet potatoes are often considered a superfood. They're loaded with nutrients. I mean, you've got poultry instead of beef and you end up accidentally eating something that you probably should eat, which is good to do that on accident sometimes. <laughs> so. Well, I would just like to thank you both for joining us today, Chef Peter Walsh from Metropolitan Community College in Lakeland Hogan from uh, Home Instead. I would like to mention that we are taking the month of January off, but we will see you again in February for um, another edition of the Home Instead Aging Well series. And as we said today, aging well happens at any age. We want to wish you a happy holiday, and thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.